Hello, everyone. I am Shane Told of Silverstein, and you are watching and listening to Rhino Radio. Or of Rhino Radio here today again, and finally, after about 10 years and a lot of mishaps along the way, I have the pleasure and the honor of spending some time with Shane Told of Silverstein. How are you doing today, Shane? Hey, I'm, I'm pretty good. Pretty good. Can't complain. All, all things right. considered. Great. And we have so many reasons to chat today. Um, first of all, I'm still celebrating a beautiful place to draw that was released almost a year ago. So I'm still okay. celebrating it. I yeah. hope you're okay with that. Sure. And then halfway through quarantine and lockdown and Corona and everything, we got Redux 2 that was released in November, if I'm not mistaken. So new versions of old hits. And recently we started talking about three shows that you guys are doing from across the Atlantic. But there's one show with the greatest hits. Uh, yeah. It's the, uh, February 6th. And then the following Saturday, you're doing Discovering the Waterfront, front to back. And then the following weekend, an acoustic unplugged set. That's correct. Is this you, the first you, time that you guys are meeting since lockdown, I think? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. We did, you know, we did the next level live stream, which uh, was a lot of fun. That was... Man, I'll tell you, like when you said a beautiful place to drown came out almost a year ago, that was that freaked me out. You, that shook me, dude. Uh, so no, the the time is is really messed up, and I'm not sure. Um, I've seen the guys here and there uh, for for a couple things, but no, I think this is going to be the first time in a long time that we've yeah we're all getting in the same room. How are you feeling about that? Nervous? Making sure that everyone's showering. <laughs> no, no, I'm not too nervous about it. You know, honestly, I think, you know, with us, uh, we're all, we're all pretty safe dudes and we've all got our very small bubbles. And I think we've all been pretty responsible. I know I have been, you know, I don't really see anybody except my partner and, uh, that's it. So, you know, it's, we're, we'll take all the safety precautions and we'll do everything we got to do. And, you know, but, but, you know, we're not, that, that that's obviously another another hoop to jump through but we've jumped through enough hoops over the past year that actually the last 20 years uh that we, we can handle it and if i'm mistaken there's also some sort of a remote vip experience for fans how's that gonna work yeah we're doing it uh just kind of like this like we're doing a zoom call right now it's going to be sort of that kind of a thing where the five of us will be you know all on a call together and then we can have somebody jump in and have a couple minutes with us to, you know, to ask us questions or tell us whatever they want. And then we'll do a virtual selfie where we can do a screenshot and then the whole thing will be recorded to uh, for a keepsake. So, you know, it, it's we, we always do VIPs and we enjoy that that time with our fans and to see their excitement and everything. Uh, and, and I think they enjoy it, too. So we wanted to bring that to to this uh, to this, this concert series as well. Okay, sounds great. And kind of touching on your podcast, Lead Singer Syndrome, um, and obviously the upcoming virtual tour, I got to ask you a question as the lead singer of Silverstein. How much gear are you going to unload for this tour? <laughs> oh, as little as possible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I haven't carried a piece of equipment in a good a good seven to eight years. No, no. Um, uh, that's a funny question. No, man, I, I think... Uh, on on a to, to to turn your funny question into a serious question, it's actually a, been a really good opportunity with this thing to hire out some crew people, um, you know, for the upcoming concert series. Uh, some people that are out of work, you know, some of the best crew crew guys in Canada haven't been able to do what they do best, which is be supportive on the road in terms of you know, sound people and lighting people and guitar techs and drum techs and everything. So we've been able to hire some of the best people in our entire country to, to work for us for this thing. So they'll have that all handled and we will, uh, we'll be able to pay them for that. So that's good. You know, we're, we're, we're creating a few jobs as well. And I want to touch on between the genre that you I don't know, maybe even founded or one of the forefathers of the emo genre. Um, and the fact that you said that you're an open book so many times 
from the lyrics and interviews and obviously the podcast that helped us learn about you as well, even though you're behind the questions most of the time. I was wondering if you ever got in trouble for sharing too much, whether it was a current girlfriend or a future girlfriend got upset because you shared too much about a past girlfriend or friendships, anything that you kind of shut yourself in the leg with just sharing oh. in a song or podcast or anywhere else. Oh, for sure, man. I, I, I've, I've done it. I've gotten to be a good liar over the years uh, about that stuff. Like, Oh no. Yeah. Don't worry, baby. It's, it's not, it's not about, it's not about you. It's just, these are just words. I just, you know, whatever. They just sound cool. You know, I got to rhyme these words together. I've said that before and I've lied before. Um, I had 100%. And yeah, it can be a little awkward when you're, when you're venting about a relationship or a fight you had when you're still in that relationship. I mean, but it's, I think, I don't think I'm alone. I'm not the only songwriter lyricist that, that has ever had that problem. I'm sure. So, um, a good thing about the, some of the lyrics I write is they have double and triple meanings. So I can tell one person, one meaning and the other person, another meaning. And, uh, and I can get off scot-free. Very nice. The human Teflon. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to kind of dive a bit more seriously into, um, into the definition of emo and um, obviously mental health about sharing um, between men that are struggling to share or just musicians in general, they're sharing. And sometimes it's enough or not enough. Obviously, we lost very, uh, a few musicians over the last couple of years. And I wanted to know if you feel that the definition of emo that you kind of started as a musician in the kind of core emo genre sharing if you feel like between mental health and emo music something changed we talked about it more we talk about it less the definition of sharing change for you where are you in that perception of of sharing music and mental health well I, you're right i am an open book and uh you know i think that was in the last question but i've always been pretty honest and pretty forthcoming with you know my own feelings and where I'm at. I'm, I'm a pretty positive guy in general, but I've been through some bouts of depression and struggling over the years, you know, here and there. And I've always been pretty honest about it. And I think, you know, even going back to the early uh, lyrics from the first album, I mean, from before the first album, when I didn't even know that people were going to hear them. You know, I mean, li at live shows, I didn't even have lyrics for my screams. I was like, it doesn't matter. I'll just scream whatever I feel like that day. No one will, no one will know what I'm saying anyway. You know, and, and it wasn't until our first album came out and, you know, people started writing words that I'd written and phrases I, I'd written like in Sharpie on their body or making t-shirts or like, you know, very primitive social media uh, like, like, or, or I guess like MSN away messages were lyrics, you know, those kinds of things. And, and then people coming up to me and saying like, yo, this, this lyric you wrote, like saved my life. And, you know, all those things started to, they, it started to hit me, you know, that what I was doing and what I was saying and what I was feeling, what I was sharing was, was important uh, in a much bigger way than just rock and roll, you know? And, and, I've always been conscious of that. I've always been very aware of that. You know, our second album, knowing that people were going to care about the lyrics, I think, excuse me, I think there was a, a, a minute there where I was like, okay, do I have to watch what I say? You know, um, and I decided at that moment, I'm never going to watch what I say. I'm going to speak from the heart. I'm going to, I'm going to sing from the heart and that's going to be the best way to resonate with people. So I've always done that. And I think that that's been important to our fans to know that they can, that, that maybe, you know, I can understand what they're going through and, and our lyrics can help them understand what they're going through too sometimes. And I mean, I don't think that mental health and emo have a huge correlation in terms of like when like nobody sang about mental health problems until this style of music came out, like obviously it's always been a thing. Um, singers have been depressed and, and have killed themselves. I mean, there was no emo music when Kurt Cobain was around, you know, um, Kurt, Chris Cornell wasn't an emo singer, you know? So I think that it's every genre, every walk of life, every person is susceptible to depression. So I think the fact that, now and and in some ways this style of music has opened up 
the discussion to be like, okay, we are allowed to talk about it. You know, we don't have to feel like, you know, super macho about, you know, you mentioned men too. We don't have to be, you know, super tough guy to, to talk about our feelings or, or talk about some of the struggles we're going through, especially this past year where I think it's probably higher than ever with people going through, through problems and depression and loneliness. So I think it's really good that everyone's m much more open to, to discussing that now. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Hopefully somebody who needed to hear that got through to them. Um, my next question, I feel like it's related to our previous topic, but you can tell me that I'm way off. <laughs> but I know that in the past you used to do dry January. I did it once. That's it. Yeah. It never came back. No, <laughs> one and done. Okay. Um, thing, it has nothing to do with mental health as well. Oh, it did. It, it, it certainly did at the time. I, th I think it, mental health and, and, you know, physical health too. You know, I, I think uh, it, when I did it, it was 2015. I, I, I was about to turn 35 because my birthday is the middle of February. It's February 13th. So I'm about to turn 40 actually, um, which is kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, I remember the beginning of 2015. I'd been I'd been drinking a lot in, in the latter part of 2014, and I felt like I needed a break, both for my personal health and for kind of my own mental health. So I decided I'd take all of January off. And this was actually the term "dry January." I know it's like a hot ter term in the UK where where you are, but but not it's not really a term here. But I just decided after New Year's I wasn't going to drink for a month. And then that turned into six weeks almost until I turned 35, went to Las Vegas with my best friend and my girlfriend at the time. And I saw Black Sabbath on my 35th birthday in Vegas. And oh, I went, I went pretty crazy. That was when dry January was over. Um, but, but no, I, I think that there's a huge benefit to, to not drinking. I mean, if you, especially if you're a person that does drinks a lot or uses alcohol as an escape mechanism, which many of us do. I think going through long periods of time, Petra, don't scratch the couch. Sorry, my cat's scratching the couch. Um, going through, you know, bouts, bouts, bouts of mental health and, and issues and alcohol being a coping mechanism, I think it's really good to take a break from it. And I encourage people to do it. I don't know why January is the month we picked. Literally, like, how, we want to make the most depressing month even more depressing. I don't know about that. But uh, I think regardless you know, drinking less or, or taking breaks from it or, or any vice you have for that matter is, is a, is a good thing. You'll learn a lot about yourself. Hey, speaking about learning about yourself, we said that you're also leading a podcast, Lead Singer Syndrome. And the funny thing is that I felt like I learned so much about you when you just ask somebody else a question. <laughs> you, you feel like you've learned something about yourself through your questions as well? Uh, it's funny. Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, I think it was early on in the show when I started it out. Like, I, I never claimed to be an interview, an interviewer, or or a, a press person. You know, I think I started the the podcast with the approach that I'm having a conversation with someone that does what I do. Maybe they're a friend. Maybe I'm a fan of theirs. Maybe I've never met them or never even heard of their band, but you know, we're having a conversation, two lead singers. And my opinion is just as, you know, probably just as valid as theirs. Right. So uh, I, I took a little bit of shit at the beginning of it. I think for people being like, Ooh, why are you talking about yourself so much? Like let the guests talk. And I, and I was like, I think at first I was a little bit like, okay, they're right. Like I need to, you know, take a back seat. Like people are tuning in to hear what they have to say, not what I have to say. And my producer who, uh, who he's not with the, with the program anymore. Unfortunately, he was great. His name was Nick. He was like, you know what? Fuck them. You talk as much as you want. This is your show. You say what you want. You know, you have opinions and you have things that, that are interesting for people. So no, fuck them. Say what you want to say. Do, and I, and I, from that, from that minute, I said, you know what? fine. I'm just going to continue that. I'm going to have a conversation. If it doesn't feel always like a, a traditional, like you ask a question, guest talks, you ask a question, get, it doesn't always feel like that. Sometimes guests are asking me questions. So I think that that is a cool format. And, you know, 
I, I, to answer your question, absolutely. I've learned a lot about myself, but what I think I've learned most from doing the podcast is just how many lead singers are so much like me in that no one starts off being a lead singer. Everyone like, look at the guitars behind me, right? I mean, everyone starts off with another instrument and then they find themselves in the position. I guess I'm the singer now. And then they go for it. Like, I swear, like 90% of the people on the show are drummers or guitar players or something and still think they are. Yeah, even though that, that somebody just quit the band and like, okay, we need a singer. Can you sing? And then the drummer starts singing and it changes everything. Exactly. I know. And, and it's, it's, it really is really interesting, but no, it does. It does. It's cool to have that, um, that what's the word uh, friendship, unity, um, f- feeling with um, companionship maybe is a good, is a good word for it with other lead singers. And, and I think it's a really cool thing that I've done and I've brought to, to the, to the people and I'm really proud of it. I've been doing the podcast for over five years now. I've been enjoying many of your, of your chats and obviously seeing you on stage and the album. So I've been following your career for many, many years. I've enjoyed everything you've done. So thank you very much for sharing everything, you, your man. life, your sounds, your thoughts with us. Before we say goodbye, I want to confront you with one rumor that I found online while <laughs> doing my research for the show. So you can either deny it or confront it. But some of your fans believe that especially during Corona, I'm guessing the final bureaucracy of it was completed, but people believe that either yourself or Silverstein have officially adopted Caleb Shomo. Is that true? <laughs> oh, I, I, we adopted him or has he adopted us? I'm really not sure. Um, but I will tell you this. Silvertooth lives, my friend, will never die. Uh, and I, I just love that man. <laughs> I, I, I love those guys. It's, it's, you know, we met them early 2015, right after dry January, or maybe that was 2016, actually. I don't remember, but when it was 2016, when I had dry January, but we met them and, and it was like, you know, we, we instantly became such so close with them and they felt like members of our own band. And then every time we see them or interact with them, it's like no time has gone by. We, we fall right into our old, you know, Bud Light drinking ways and, they're just some of the best people and what a band. I can't wait for the new bear tooth stuff to come out, blow people's minds. And, uh, Hey, maybe we'll get a silver tooth. Uh, maybe we'll get a two silver tooth, seven inch could be coming. And now when the warp tour is no longer as it was, and hopefully one day festivals will come back to the UK. Slam yeah. dunk is the closest thing. So maybe we can get oh. some silver tooth at slam dunk. I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. I love slam dunk. It's a, it's a good time, man. No, I, I missing, I'm missing the festivals for sure. And I, man, it's getting later and later in 2021, you know, and I, I hope that they're going to happen, but it doesn't look good. It will come. It will come not today, not tomorrow, but we'll gather again in a, in a well. wet, in a wet farm somewhere. <laughs> we'll march a little bit. <laughs> I'm not going to take too much more of your time. Shane told of Silverstein, we said that a beautiful place to drown, which is one of my favorite albums by Silverstein, is out. We got Redux 2. February is going to be covered in virtual shows, so we can all join you in a virtual mosh pit and destroy our living rooms. Is there anything else you want to say to fans and listeners before we say goodbye? No, I just want to touch a little bit more on that. Uh, February 6th, 13th, and 20th, we're going to be doing three uh, virtual concerts, right? Yeah. Right from the comfort of your own living room. And I guess they're going to be at 10 ooh, PM UK. Time? 10 PM UK. All right. So yeah, it's going to get a little dark, a little spooky, which is perfect. And it's, it's going to be really exciting. We, we've put together uh, a lot of great ideas to make this more than just a rock band playing. It's going to be very entertaining and very exciting and you're going to love it. Okay. Shane, of Silverstein. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, man.